Effective leaders have characteristics that are untrainable or extremely difficult to train. It is easier to hire them than to develop them. False. True? False. 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 Like, really? Now, do you think anyone can be an effective leader? Yes. You think anyone can be an effective leader? Short of being uh, psychologically damaged. <laughs> psychologically damaged. I've met a lot of those people. Okay. Anyone can be an effective leader. It, it, I believe it's a very learnable skill. And unlike charisma, most of the folks are looking for credibility, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of authenticity. And those are all very learned skills. They're very learnable skills, too. To does, extent. does everyone agree with this crazy talk? What you say? <laughs> he said, he said all of these things like authenticity are learned skills. You know, they're very, they're very, um, they're, they're they're very learnable. Right? I'll tell you what. I just to give you an indication. Right? I have a colleague. He, when he did this study, he was at the University of Minnesota, the Carlson School of Management. He's the first person I know of that has simply asked a large sample of practicing, you know, managers and executives this very simple question. Do you believe that leadership and management is about a set of characteristics that can be trained, right? that can be effectively trained? Well, I mean, he's a psychologist too, so he didn't ask one question. He asked 20 questions, you know, five-point scale, all of this stuff, right? Um, but he was really interested in simply what is the percentage of it? What's the base rate of managers who believe that leadership cannot be trained, right? And he sent that survey out to over 5,000 people. And so, of those 5,000, what do you believe? What percentage believe that leadership was about attributes that could not be trained? 60%? Yeah. Wow. It's a pessimistic view. Not pessimistic enough. Almost 70%. All right, so almost 70%, when you ask the question in a fairly sophisticated way, believe that leadership is about attributes you cannot effectively train. By the way, that wasn't the most interesting part of the study. Part two of this study, he went back into those organizations and tried to identify how much time people dedicated to training and developing leadership. So if you believed that leadership could not be trained, how much time did you dedicate to it? Oh, no. right. Unless your organization incented you in some way for it, and then you, you, you tried something but your heart wasn't really in it. That was not the most interesting part of this study. Part three of this study, you know, those 5,000 people weren't all in the same company. Right, they were actually distributed across uh, you know, 150 different organizations. And you can imagine that in any given organization, the percentage wasn't always around 68%. Right? In some organizations, that percentage was higher, 85%. But in some organizations, that percentage was lower, 30%. Right? It was a little skewed on the high side. Right? Um, he did something interesting. You know, he started looking at that percentage and then tracking the financial performance of those organizations across time and did this you know, fairly sophisticated longitudinal study where he did multiple waves of measurement. What do you think he determined? The organizations in which you had a lower percentage of people believing that leadership could not be trained, in other words, you had a higher percentage of believing that leadership could be, those organizations financially outperformed others. And they did so even against others within their own industry. Like that was actually the most interesting part of the study. Yeah, uh, uh, what he basically demonstrated was that that percentage, you know, the, the lower that percentage, the better financially performing those organizations were and were across time. Right? So the more people you had in your organization believing that leadership could be developed, then the better financially performing those companies were. Could be developed. Yeah, could be. Right? What's really interesting to me, I actually don't care what the real answer to that question is. What I care about is what's sitting inside your head. Do you believe this is true or do you believe this is false? Because that starts to tell me a little bit about your approach to development. Right? And the lower that percentage, right? in other words, the more people in the organization who believe in development, then the bigger or the broader or the more, um, the, the more central the developmental culture is of that company. And those companies, if you look at his research, have a much easier time attracting and retaining people. Right? They have incredibly low turnover rates, they have very high employee engagement scores, right? and they're constantly reskilling their workforce based on changes in their environment. And that translated into the financial performance of those companies. That's why it's an interesting phenomenon, right? uh, this, this, basic, this basic question. I have a, a colleague, she's a psychology professor at, uh, at Stanford, her name is Carol, Carol Dweck. Uh, and Dweck, you know, if you want to read a really good book that every manager or executive should read, it's a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. It's fabulous. But it basically focuses on this question, the problem of perspective, what you believe 
but because what you believe affects dramatically how you behave and act towards others. Okay, so that's obviously false, as I just mentioned it. I'll, I'll kind of skip through that. Um, Self-awareness is an important leadership attribute. Yes, of course. Right? You know, that, one's, that one's really simple. But not in the way that you would expect. Right? Maybe in the way that you would expect. Okay. Um, the, way, uh, the way I can describe this, I'll tell you one more study, and then I'll try to stop talking about research. Um, this, again, is another colleague of mine who, uh, who was deeply interested in the extent to which the more self-aware you are as a leader, then the more successful you will be perceived to be by others, right? or the more effective they will evaluate or rate you. Right? And the way he indexed self-awareness was probably, I think, the only way that we can do it. You know, he went to something called a 360-degree feedback tool. Anyone, are you familiar with these? Is anyone familiar with 360s? Just a few of you. So 360s are a, a, a management evaluation tool where I give you a survey that's about skills, and I ask you, Jeff, tell me, you rate yourself on these skills. But I don't stop there. I go to your boss and I say, rate Jeff on these skills. Then I go to some of your peers, right, say, rate Jeff. Then I go to some of your employees and I say, rate Jeff. Right? And what I'm interested in is the extent to which how you evaluate yourself is consistent with how all those other people or perspectives are evaluated. Right? And what he basically said, because I mean, to me the only way that you can index self-awareness is by looking at consistency in those perspectives. Are you evaluating yourself similar to how all those other groups are evaluating you? That would be somebody who's self-aware in this context. Uh, and if how you evaluate yourself is very different than how people are consistently evaluating you, then that's a lack of self-awareness. I mean, I can't go to you and say, Randy, Randy are you self-aware? Absolutely. I mean, there's no way you're self-aware. Come on, am I going to take your word for that? No, of course not, right? You know, so, um, so he looked at 360s. He actually went to a consulting firm that this is what they do. You know, for organizations like yours, they just do 360s for managers and executives. They gave him almost 100,000 managers 360 results. Right? That's like a great data set, you know, if you're a psychologist. Yeah, uh, and where he also had a scale that evaluated the perceived effectiveness of those leaders. So he quickly ran the analysis, and the more self-aware you were, the more you were perceived to be an effective leader. Right? That was not the most interesting part of the study. This is where it gets really fascinating. Right? So he went back into those 100,000 cases, and he set a couple of criteria to pull out two groups. Right? One group were, this 360 measured 10 different skills, like how good are you at motivating other people? Um, are you good at strategic thinking? You know, those kinds of things. All right, and he said, I'm going to pull out a group who are roughly good at five of those skills, but not good at five of those skills. Right? And then I'm going to pull out another group that's not good at roughly all ten of those skills. Right? And I want to see which of those two groups is the more effective. So over here we have good at five, not good at five, not good at all ten. So which of these two groups would be rated on average more effective? They're not good at I'm sorry? They're not good at the team. See, once again, you're just giving me the least likely answer, right? Okay, trick question. Um, the other part, the other criterion that was used to select these two groups, over here, fully knowledgeable about the fact that they were good at five things, completely lacked knowledge about the five things they were not good at. That was the second part of the criterion, the awareness part. Right? This group, fully knowledgeable about the fact that they were not good at all ten. I suspect slightly or, or clinically depressed by that fact. But it was. <laughs> that was part of the criteria. This is, this is fascinating. Think about this for a second. Under that condition, the awareness condition, this group was evaluated on average as more effective than that group. The, the skillless but aware of the fact that they were skillless was rated more effective than the people with skills but were unaware of the things they weren't good at. Right? Yeah, to me, I mean, it was like this, this brilliant study that demonstrated the importance of that word that you mentioned, authenticity, right? You know, basically what he demonstrated was it's awareness of the things that we're not good at that really gives us enormous opportunity. It gives me opportunities to, um, to, to hire that capability onto my team, but only if I'm aware of the things that I'm not good at and willing to admit to it, right? Uh, it also allows me to avoid those credibility-damaging moments, right? By proclaiming to the world that I'm actually really good at something, that everyone knows that I'm really horrible at. Right? Which is amazing to me the frequency with which that actually occurs. But you know, nonetheless, that, that was the power of that phenomenon. So self-awareness actually turns out to be critical, primarily because it, it focuses on the things that, that we need to be you know, developing or aware of. The reason I have this on here is that if you think about management and talent development, one of the most crucial elements of that is the ability to give 
proper feedback to people, right, through all kinds of methods and methodologies to help them identify and understand, you know, what are their areas of needed development within their current job, but maybe even more importantly, for the job that you anticipate that person being moving into at some point down the road, two, three, four years, right, you know, so that it's anticipatory and you're strategically developing people for roles before they get there, assuming that they're great at everything, and then through happenstance or through an unfortunate circumstance, find out that they're actually not. Okay. Uh, to me, one of the most central elements of talent management is not just talent identification, you know, it's talent development in preparation for future roles. Right. And in my experience, organizations, even ones that claim to be pretty sophisticated with this, aren't nearly as sophisticated as they need to be. Okay, so that's obviously true. Let me, uh, let me jump ahead. Effective leaders typically share a fairly common set of characteristics. Yes? True? False? This one is dead false, right? And you, you will want to tell me it's true. You will be certain in your own mind that there are certain characteristics that are absolutely essential, right? Well, I can tell you, we've been doing research on leadership empirically, scientifically, right, since uh, about 1902. And the first, the first study that I ever saw that was a real scientific study of leadership was published in 1902 by a psychologist named Turman. And from 1902 until the mid-1970s, we were trying to figure out what they were. You know, what are these common characteristics of leadership? You know, we were looking for the, the holy grail, or the, the unified theory of leadership. And in that roughly 75 years of leadership research, what do you think we, we determined? It, it all depends. Actually, as academics, we don't say that. We say, it's all very complex. <laughs> and more importantly, it justifies doing the next study. Right? Uh, but it has to. I mean, it absolutely has to. Um, it depends on the level of leadership we're talking about. Right? You know, are we talking about a vice president of your organization? Or are we talking about a project manager? It depends upon, yes? Would, 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 would the uh, circumstance also be an influence here, whereas some people are could be very good at building an enterprise, but not good at sustaining. Absolutely. Some yeah. people could not be good at building or sustaining, <coughs> but they're good at turning it around. Absolutely. So, so circumstance. The, the key message. Important. The key right. message is that it's all about circumstance, right? In the sense that the reason I can't tell you that here are the ten common characteristics is because it depends on a variety of circumstances. Um, industry. Actually, interestingly enough, it does depend on industry. Level of leadership, those are different circumstances. Um, organizational culture differences. Are we talking about leadership at Google? Are we talking about leadership at you know, ExxonMobil? Right? Um, it depends functionally. Are we talking about leadership in an R&D function? Are we talking about leadership in a finance and accounting function? Right? It, geographically, cross-culturally, it matters actually quite a lot. Right? So based on all of those contextual factors, it makes it really, really difficult to define a common core. Now, one of the things that, you know, is the natural outcome of this, and I find it very frustrating, and I spend a lot of time debating with companies about this these days, is organization after organization after organization wants to develop what we refer to as a competency model, right? A competency model that's going to define the skills that are requisite among managers and leaders in their organization. Now, if you buy my argument that you have to pay very close attention to these contextual elements, what's the value of that competency model? The, the purpose of the competency model can only be to help you reinforce certain cultural elements that you want in your leaders. You have to recognize that at any given leadership role, you're going to have to look at that competency model and ask lots of questions. You know, what makes sense for that job at that part of the organization in this state? Are we talking about Texas? Are we talking about New York? Right? All of those factors you know, affect it. Right? So, uh, you know, we, we don't know what they are. Interestingly, if you if you ask the question, yes, sir. Does that mean that say you have a highly effective employee, um, you shouldn't bother to spend time trying to figure out what makes them effective and duplicating that in other employees? So the question is, if you have a highly effective employee, do you use that as a case example of what you want out of employees? Um, I think it's a lot more complex than that. Right? Much, much more complex than that. Uh, one of the problems that you can now exacerbate is uh, a assuming that you can be you can define you know what actually led to that employee's success. Right? Um, second, you'll likely commit you know what is a, uh, a, an absolutely horrible error, 
and that is to assume that by looking at someone who's successful and what their attributes are, it tells you anything at all about success. You have to look at people who are successful and people who are unsuccessful, right? And identify what's different between those two people and then kind of go through success. So when we do research on what drives performance in a particular role, that's kind of the way we're approaching the question. It's not just looking at success. That's only half the equation. It's what we call sampling on the dependent variable. Yeah, so that, that's the problem. And it's, it's the same problem with this whole notion of best practices. If you, whenever I hear anybody use the word best practices, I cringe. Occasionally I get this kind of feeling in my stomach, you know, that makes, makes me not be able to eat for days. Because best practices, the way it's typically defined, is go out and find successful organizations and see what they do, right? That actually can't tell you much. You need to see if the things that those companies do, if the companies that aren't successful are doing the same thing, you've just learned nothing, right? But people usually don't do the second part of this. But the best practices aren't uh, the effective yet. Um, I think you disagree with the Jim Collins concept of a couple of Damn it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I disagree. I disagree. I disagree only in the sense, right, that I think there are many, many different views of leadership out there. Many models, frameworks, ideas. I mean, you can go, you can go to a level five leadership or you can go to, you know, Attila the Hun's approach to leadership, right? You know, and read about that. Hey, in every book you will read, in every framework that you will find, you will have some wisdom there. But rarely is it based on good empirical research. More often it is based on this kind of model of research. And good to great, I'm, I'm in my, I mean, as a business school professor, I have to read all of these books because someone in my class is gonna say, but good to great said, right? Well, my job is to point out that that's really bad research. There might be some nuggets of wisdom there, right? You know, but I would rather base, you know, a billion dollar decision on something that's really good research than something that is just a nugget of wisdom. All right, so I can take things out of that, but I'm not gonna bet the time on it. So yes. just for a second back to best practice, what I hear you say is that in order to implement a best practice, we need to be aware of the context with which that practice evolved to begin with. Correct. correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. And I think that's a very important finding. I mean, one of the one of the slides that I'm definitely not going to get to is about how we evaluate people's performance. And in the energy industry, which I love criticizing, uh, since they're all my clients, um, there is this this process of doing what's referred to as forced ranking. Right? How many does in, how many do, how many of you do not know what forced ranking is? Okay, forced ranking is a really simple system. So you have ten people reporting to you. Right, so I tell you when you do your performance evaluation of those 10 people, only a certain percentage, let's say 20%, can get the top evaluation on the performance evaluation. 10% have to get the bottom evaluation. And the rest, the other 70% are distributed somewhere in the middle. Right? Uh, so if there's some kind of curve that I'm forcing to the performance of your people, whether or not that curve makes sense or not. Right? And then we're going to allocate all of those important things on the basis of that distribution. Right, and you know, Alec, roll it up and roll it up and roll it up. Um, you know, there is no compelling evidence at all suggesting that this has anything other than a detrimental effect on people's performance and productivity. Right? And <coughs> nothing. There's no research out there at all suggesting it has a positive effect. Right? Nonetheless, every organization in the energy industry does it. Why do they do it? So you have a concentration model that you have to follow, and everybody doesn't get the high rate, and everybody doesn't get the low rate, so we enforce the, the performance, and you tell somebody, you know, you're really a good guy, but because I only have so many outstanding increases, you're an average employee. But don't take that part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're not really average, but you're just average relative to everybody else. Right? You know, so, um, I, actually, I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic. Right? I'm, I'm, my, my view is that, and primarily because I've had these conversations with them, is that the reason one company does it is because they've seen another company do it. Right? And, and they see that other company as a successful organization, and they look into that company and say, here's a practice that I think drove that success, so I'm going to take it and put it in place in my organization. Oftentimes to very detrimental effects. Yes? Also because Jack Welsh said to do it. Yes. The, Jack Welsh said to continually re replace the bottom 10% of your, your workforce, and so you've got to find the bottom 10%. And the logic is brilliant, right? You know, the logic is brilliant, which is I can always increase 
the capability of my organization by getting rid of my lower performers. But now think about that for a second. That is predicated on a set of assumptions that as I get rid of them, I can replace them with better, yeah. right? Yeah. It also is predicated on the assumption that I can make accurate decisions regarding who's actually the bottom 10%, right? I'm a psychologist. I have a very negative and pessimistic view of the quality of human beings to make these kinds of decisions. Right? You know, we've got decades of research suggesting that we're not very good at it. Right? So uh, usually the system starts to become a bit unjust. And even GE, right? You know, uh, even GE has walked away you know, from their force ranking system because of the inability to do that. Do you want me to keep moving? <laughs> that would be good. Sure. Um, you know, so again, you do, you can't think about addressing the talent problem by looking at another organization and grabbing one thing and throwing it in there and saying, oh, this is gonna do it for us, right? It won't, it has to be consistent with your organization and its culture and the capabilities of your people there. But in, in a little bit of fairness to them too, they, they all, he also talked about repositioning that person, if there if yeah. it wasn't a fit. So here, here's, my, here's, my, so here's my problem. So the, the logic in GE is, is probably the right one, which is every manager has a fundamental responsibility to differentiate performance. Right? I believe that. I don't think you can legislate it very effectively with a system like forced ranking. But, but with their forced ranking system, the one thing that GE does that not everyone has adopted who saw that model is that they make an enormous investment in the development of people. Right? So if I evaluate someone as the bottom part of my performance distribution, or Right. Well, the promise that I'm now making is that we're going to invest in their development to actually give them the opportunity to move up that performance scale. Right. Now, if I do those two things together, right, if, I try to, if I make the investment in someone and then they're not performing, well, it's just and fair for me to say, okay, we put the investment in, it's time for you to go. Right. Uh, but if I have not made that investment and then I just send someone packing, now I've started to create an unfair and unjust culture in my organization. And the energy companies that I've seen that have adopted it, you know, have fallen victim to the latter. So they just see the forced ranking. They don't see the investment and development that actually makes it more fair. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. I think when it gets down to this kind of premise you were saying just in the beginning, comparing the 60s to the 80s, whatever it was, it's a breach of trust. There's no, if there's no investment in the individual straight off. Yes. Yeah, I, I will trust the organization if the culture is perceived as fair based on the investments that are willing to make it. Right? So I'm more likely to be able to accept that kind of system in a culture that I perceive as fair and just. Right? And I think that's that's a very valuable insight. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Let's do a couple more. I have no idea what time it is. really read my watch. Um, managers are most likely to lose their jobs and have their careers halted due to a lack of technical, functional capability or business knowledge. <coughs> True? True. Absolutely false. Right. Absolutely false. <clears throat> you know, nonetheless, this is the typical target of learning and development. Right? Let's, let's teach people industry knowledge. Let's pe teach people uh, technical knowledge. Let's teach people you know, functional business knowledge. Right? Uh, really, the interesting question is none of that is what typically causes people to fail, like in mass. You know, once they make it to the management or professional levels. Right? I think this is a, uh, you know, one of the things I used to do in my classes, I, I've now had a chance to teach over 10,000 executives. And for the first part of my career, because of the nature of the classes that I taught, I would have people show up to my class with a top 10 list. And the top 10 list was the top 10 characteristics of ineffective bosses from your past. Right? People loved creating that top 10 list. Sometimes people would give me like the top 100. Right. Yeah, so restricting it to the top ten was you know was hard, and then we'd have a class discussion around you know, around it at one point in the, in the program. So based on uh, I stopped collecting them after getting about close to four thousand. Any guesses why I stopped collecting them? Everybody gave me the same list, right? Yeah, and I kind of categorized. It. I used the language that people was put, what they were putting on their lists. I'm sorry about the formatting problems. Um, I used the language that they put on their lists, but it's their language. Right? And these are the common categories. What do you notice about these categories? What's missing up there? These are very personal or personality related, right? Yeah, absolutely. The things that people perceive in ineffective bosses are all personality related things. They're dispositional, right? What you don't see up there are things like lacks technical knowledge, doesn't understand the business, right? Those kinds of things. 
Right? And to me, that's kind of fascinating. It, it just kind of supports a point that we've made a lot in management, which is, you know, your technical know-how will likely get you into a role, and it's your lack of interpersonal ability that will get you off track, probably get you fired, or right, get you out of the organization. But if you think about the investments in development, we make the investments in development in technical knowledge, but we rarely make the investments in development in kind of the interpersonal knowledge that's necessary to be good in professional jobs. Yeah, so if you want to really develop and groom talent, five minutes, how could that be? Okay. Okay, let me jump. That's boring. Okay, there's, a, there's one more in here. Uh, that's kind of boring. Ah. Leadership is best learned through experience. True? False? So here I'm the professor, right? You know, what, what do you think my answer is going to be to this? No. Okay, you're going to be disappointed. True and false. <laughs> now, now, there is a very important reason why this one is here. Okay? In my experience, you know, and I've now had a chance to work with about 75 or 80 different companies you know, on their approach to performance management and talent management. And I can tell you, even companies that claim or profess to be incredibly, incredibly you know, um, sophisticated about developing talent, right, managing talent, at the end of the day, when you, when you lift up the hood and you look in there, more often than not, their entire process of managing and developing talent is simply built on this assumption. Right? And the way the assumption usually goes is, you know what, if we hire smart people into our organization, well, because we've hired smart people, you know, they're going to get access to all of these different learning opportunities because they're going to get lots of different experiences in our company. And if we have hired smart people, they will naturally learn the right things from those experiences. And then 10, 11, maybe 5, 6 years later, we're going to have someone who is prepared to be uh, an executive of our organization. Is that a good model for developing people, for managing talent? Built, built on that assumption? It's an awful problem, right? If you think about all of the qualifications in there, it assumes that people get access to the right experiences at the right stages of their career to be able to learn the right lessons, prepare them for that next role, right? It assumes that people actually learn the right lessons from the experiences that they get, right? Do you think that's true? No. No, it's not. I mean, my, my favorite example of this, I, I, have, I have to tell this, right? So um, one of the companies that I, I spent about five years working for is uh, the uh, private bank and investment bank, Credit Suisse. Right? And uh, I used to do programs for them at their training facility, which is just right outside of Zurich, on the lake in a Swiss chalet. Right? That's the difference between an energy company and an investment bank. Right? And, and I, I had about 45 private bankers and investment makers in my class, and we were talking about things, and we spent some time talking about ineffective cleaners. Right? And at break time, I had one of, the, uh, one of the investment makers come up to me who was a director at Credit Suisse. And he said, Brent, I've got to tell you about my boss. OK, tell me about your boss. Right? And then he started, so he's talking about his managing director. So he started describing his boss. Um, let's just say using language that I can't exactly repeat here. Right? But he described the most autocratic, demeaning, insensitive, overbearing, spirited, you know, volatile individual you could possibly ever imagine. Well, what was weird is as he was telling me this, he had a smile on his face. So I kept hearing the words that he was using to describe this guy, but seeing the look of kind of absolute delight on his face, thinking there's something deeply wrong here, right? <laughs> so finally, you know, after he went, went on for about five minutes, I stopped him and said, oh, man, this is awful. I'm really sorry that you worked for this guy. This is horrible. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, how you're surviving this, right? But I'm curious. You seem to, you seem to be delighted by the fact, right? And, you know, he... he he stopped for a minute and he looked a little pensive, like he was seriously considering my question. You know, um, and then he, 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 I'm paraphrasing, but he said back to me, effectively, well, Brent, you know what this has taught me? Well, it's taught, you know, I'm gonna be, like, that guy's gonna move on in maybe six months, right? And he's been in that job for a while, and I'm most likely to get promoted into his role. And as soon as I get that job, I can do all of those things too. <laughs> My jaw dropped to the ground. And I'm like, oh man, you got some serious remedial work to do here. <laughs> what this guy learned, right? Basically, what he learned from, from the organization, Credit Suisse, their willingness to tolerate that behavior in his boss, what they proved to him was that that behavior was tolerable, right? And when he got that promotion, so long as he was performing, or his group was performing, he could do all that stuff. 
right, and the organization will allow it. Now, to me, probably one of the most fundamental problems with that logic, that leadership is best learned through experience, right, is that the experiences that most people have reinforce a model of leadership that we really don't want, or that many people have. When we tolerate, as an organization, as a senior executive, when we tolerate you know, characteristics of leaders below us that are inconsistent with the culture of our organization, we're training everyone below that individual in a bad model of leadership. And if you want a fundamental factor of contributing to difficulty in attracting and retaining talent, it's that. It's promoting people who are bad leaders. Right? If we can simply take that out of the equation, right, people will be much further ahead. Right? But every, every successful organization that I work with, you know, they don't like they don't like to admit the fact that they do it, but over and over they promote bad leadership. Right, because that individual is usually achieving some result and that's important. Now, it's true because the only way to really learn leadership is through the appropriate use of experiences, but it has to be proactive, meaning that I actually have to identify what development need you have, identify an experience that will help you work on that need, give you access to it, and then coach and mentor and guide you through that process to ensure you learn that right lesson. Right? And if I do those things, then I'm doing the things that are right and will help manage the problem. So since I'm almost since I'm out of time, you know, obviously the point that I'm trying to make to you is, if you think about all of these elements, you know, it's not one thing; it's your entire kind of philosophical approach to how you manage and develop people that builds the brand that will help you attract and retain. Right? And if you can do that consistently over time, you will easily beat your competitors. You'll easily. Beat your competitors. Cool. Thank you very much.